Steve Chinook and Y Lab. topic way, way, way back in the day when we had to walk to school on our bare feet. Um, just kidding, but not really. Right? So um, I feel pretty equipped to talk a little bit about how to best prepare for tournaments. Hopefully um, I can do so in an entertaining and interactive way. And if at any point you have a question or want to chime in, you should feel free to do so, including you, Varad. I expect some interaction from you especially. All right, so let's start off with a little bit of SAT testing, right? Some of you might have already taken it. You've probably taken the PSAT, and you're about to take that big test that will determine the future uh, of your academic career in a year or two. JK, not really, right? But let's define the terms. What do we mean by tournament? Uh, a tournament is like a competition. where like uh, many teams enter, and then like, uh, at first, like in debate, like do our pair randomly with other people. After like the first couple of rounds, it's power match. Power match means like people the same record as you. All right, I'm gonna stop you right there. Let's focus on the basic stuff, right? Is there a competitive element involved in tournaments? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And why do you compete at tournaments? Well, optimally it's to get better, but in reality, why do so many of you compete at tournaments? You want to win stuff, right? You want the gold, you want the trophies, you want the plaques, etc., right? And is there just one debate that you have at a tournament, or is it more than one? Right, it's a series of contests, right? And Viv, I'll talk a little bit about that, right? And do you necessarily have to have a lot of teams to have a tournament? No. No, do you have a tournament with three teams? Yeah. Presumably, right, but you at least need to have more than one. Right, team to have a tournament. So at its basic core, a tournament is a series of contests between a number of competitors who compete for an overall prize. Now, what's the prize for your tournament tomorrow? Knowledge. All right, knowledge, sure, but is that really what, why a lot of you are here? Okay, so for a lot of you, it's to win, right? So tomorrow, or like on Friday, in your like last lab, your labs will give out awards, right? Who the top three teams in your lab are, like, or who the top team in your lab is, who the top three speakers of the lab are, and for some of you, that's an attractive prospect, right? Maybe that's what motivates you to do well over the next couple of days, right? For some of you, it's just like to get better, right? Hey, do I know how to flow? Yes, check the box, right? I feel like I'm better at debate. Do I know how to do line by line? Check, right? I've achieved that prize, right? Because the extra rounds in the tournament have allowed me to, to get better at that. Or maybe you have some rivalries, right? Maybe there's an Alpharetta versus Cambridge rivalry, right? Maybe there's a Westminster versus Pace rivalry, right? Maybe there's a Cypress Bay versus, you know, Carroll State Sacred Art rivalry. You're like, who knows, right? And maybe there's something small like, hey, we want to debate them, and maybe we can win and have some drag or next when we get home. But regardless, there's a series of contests involving a number of competitors who compete for a prize of some sort. Right? But what do we mean by prep or preparation? What does prep time mean? For example, Viva. Uh, like how, like, wait, like prep time? Yeah, like what does prep and prep time refer to? Around. So like when, when you don't have speeches, uh, 
or like blocks or anything prepared, you take prep time to prepare them in round. Right. Well, let's define what prep means. Oh, like, prepared. all right, define what that means. Like to get ready for uh, your speech. Like, all right. To prepare your documents and evidence. All right. So it's the process of getting ready to do something, right? And dictionary definition is the action or process of making ready or being made ready for use or consideration. So when you're using your prep time, you are getting yourself ready to do what? Give a speech, right? Presumably a good one, right? And what do you do during that preparation time? Do you just like check Facebook and like Snapchat your friends? Probably, right? But in addition to that, you're gonna do what? Right, organize your thoughts, maybe put together a speech doc, use that all-important tilde key, right? Maybe ask your partner some questions about, hey, is the two AC, is, was the two AC number three, the link turn, right? Confirm that stuff. But it's the action or process of making ready or being made ready for use or consideration. In this case, the process of becoming ready to give a speech in debate. Right? Therefore, what does tournament prep mean or refer to? Yeah. Right, let's think more big picture, right? Preparation is a process of, be, of becoming ready, right? A tournament is a series of contests between competitors for the overall prize. So if we had to meld those two together or a permutation of those terms, what would it be? Yeah, Luke. The process of getting ready to compete against others. The process of getting ready to compete against others, right? I'm emphasizing process because I think it's important, right? Doing the process, committing to the process, and doing that process well is, it almost always dictates the product of that result. So how many of you are like me that love debate because you like to win? Right? Do you just show up and win? Is that how it works? No. Maybe if you're Westminster. Right, but maybe not. Okay? But for even Westminster debaters, even Carrollton Tinker Art debaters, even debaters that go to the schools that have the best debaters and all the resources in the world, what do you still have to commit to do? Can you just show up and win? No, you have to be committed to the process. The process, in this case, of preparing, of getting yourself ready to give what you do in debates, the speeches that largely dictate who wins and who loses. So I'm going to move on to some big picture considerations, then go on to sort of some smaller micro considerations, and then kind of sum up what I think tournament preparation, both for tomorrow and future tournaments, involve. One, the, one of the biggest things that you can do to prepare for tournaments is to know the calendar. How many of you have talked to your debate coaches about what tournament you're going to be attending to in the fall or what your tournament options are in the fall? Right, I see a lot of kind of, sort of, and a lot of, nope. Right, well, why are you at debate camp? Is it to help you prepare for the tournaments that you might be going to in a couple of months? Right, well, do you know when your first tournament will be? What happens if it's in a week? Are you ready? Might you want to know that it's in a week? Right, but you know that it's probably not, right? If you go by last year, for example, when was your first tournament? What? Like September, maybe? Okay, some of you early September, some of you maybe mid to late September. Well, what does that knowledge that your first tournament's in September do for you? Right, you've got more time to prepare, right? Do you have to start freaking out that like the national tournament is in uh, a week in one day? No, right? Instead, you can maybe do other things like focus on stuff that's not to be, or maybe explore other affirmative or negative options to sort of get a more wholesome and comprehensive grasp of what the topic means, right? Does that give you more time to practice, right? Give more practice speeches, work on enunciation, for example, right? Between now and then, so that you can maybe start the season off on a strong note, right? How many of you go to maybe like a tournament per month to compete? Okay. How many of you go to more than one tournament per month to compete? Okay. How many of you go to maybe a couple of tournaments per semester to compete? Right. As you can see, there's no universal debate calendar. Like we all don't all go to the same tournaments. And so knowing that, hey, every two weeks I'm going to have a tournament is a lot different from every two months I'm going to have a tournament. But regardless, the point is, is that you should know your calendar. And for a lot of you in the state of Georgia especially, do you know that there's a calendar online that you can just search and find to know what your potential tournament options are? Who knows that? Right? Your coaches do. Right? And what's that, what's that website? <coughs> All right, so if you're going to Google it, 
and you're maybe going to press that I'm feeling lucky button. Right? What do you think you have to include when you're searching for a calendar about debate tournaments on Google? Like what term? No, even more basic than that. If you're searching for a calendar <laughs> using Google, what's a term you should certainly include in your search? GFCA. How about calendar? Okay. If you type in GFCA, tell me what you find. Believe it or not, there are more than one organizations called the GFCA. Right? And the GFCA, right? Might not be what you're looking for, but you know you have to type in calendar, right? What is the GFCA bit about? Right, so it's a, like an umbrella organization in the state of Georgia, right? Participated in by a bunch of high school teams, right? And presumably they talk about debate stuff there. And so if you did GFCA calendar in Google and press, I'm feeling lucky, right? What might you find? A calendar of the tournaments, right, in the state of Georgia, right? And do you think that might be a good idea to kind of have right now? to sort of see what options you have available. Maybe even start to plan your fall semester. Maybe talk to your coaches about what tournaments are viable for you and what ones aren't, which ones work for you or which ones don't. Yeah, I think so, right? So you gotta know the calendar, right? And I think it's important for all of you to talk to your coach, your parents, um, your teammates, uh, your partner as early as possible to sort of plan out and figure out what your tournament schedule is gonna be. Right, so if you go to Cambridge and you know you're only going to go to maybe four or five tournaments in a year, don't you want to make sure that the four to five tournaments you go to are the ones that all of you can go to? Yeah, probably, right? And if you go to like Carrollton Sacred Heart and you go to a couple tournaments a month, right, you might want to make sure that like nothing conflicts, right? And maybe like you and Deke Hyde are like, you know, you're like the, you know, you really work. And maybe you want to make sure that you can always go to the tournament where Deke Hyde is present, right? Or maybe you're like, hey, my birthday is November 20th. Right? And this year, maybe the Westminster tournament falls on November 20th. And maybe that's a conflict that you can't resolve. Right? Maybe your family has plans to go on like a really nice vacation to Hawaii. Right? Or maybe you're going to drive to Gatlinburg. Or who knows? Right? But you know that deep down, like, you can't make the birthday and the tournament work. And maybe it's good to know now to tell your coach that, hey, I can't make that tournament because I've got a, a prior conflict. Right? Doing that work now makes a lot of sense. Right? And Herndon and some other people in college debate, you're like, they'll tell you that I've already thought about this. Like, I've already had conversations with other coaches about what tournament they're going to, when tournament dates are, et cetera, because I'm a planner, and I generally think that the more you plan and the earlier you do it, the more prepared you are for any contingencies that arrive, right? And it's never a bad idea to have an idea of where you're going to travel to and what tournament you want to attend, right, early rather than not. Generally, I think a goal, your goal should be a balance. Do you have the ability to date every single weekend? No, right? If you look at the GFCA calendar of the state of Georgia, there's a tournament almost every weekend. Sometimes it's a like, two-day tournament, some days it's a one-day tournament. But do you literally have the capacity to debate every weekend? Probably not. For some of you, that's a financial constraint. For some of you, it's just like, uh, I've got other things i got to do, so like there's a time constraint. And for some of you, there's just like, the, I'm going to wear myself down, burn myself out, get sick, right? Maybe just like, uh, it just doesn't work, right? And so you've got to know that you're not going to go to every tournament, right? Right? And so it's up to you and your partner and your coaches and your family to find the perfect medium. Right? In a perfect world, I think you might want to debate once a month. Right? But do we live in a perfect world? No. Right? And we have to work with the resources and opportunities we've been given. And so if you know you're only going to go to four to five tournaments, it's important to know what those are now and maybe start the process of preparing for them going forward. And hopefully it includes the UGA tournament. So I'd like to see all of you there. Right? Next, debate success is largely dictated by what you do regarding the calendar. Right? How many of you work on debate a little bit every day? Most of you don't, right? Some of you do, right? Why might there be a reason to work on debate a little bit Monday through Friday instead of maybe just sit waiting until like Friday night to do all your debate work? Yeah, come on. Continuous prep means that like you're more familiar with your material. I mean, it gives you more time to figure out arguments. Maybe like run through like new ones if you come across those. All right, so there's just this general like consistent exposure generally, you know, results in better learning, right? How many of you take a foreign language? Most of you do, right? And do you do your language stuff all in one day, or are you forced to do it almost, if not every day? Almost, if not every day, okay? Some of you are like, definitely procrastinate. But generally, right, most of you don't have a language in one day in school, right? You have a language maybe three, four days a week, right? And why do you think that is? Yeah. So we practice every day. So you practice almost every day. That's how we learn languages, 
right? You didn't learn how to speak English by speaking English once every, you know, one day a week for the first four years of your life. You do it what? Every day, right? And debate at its core is like a foreign language. It's not natural, right? We have this weird tech stuff called verbatim and word, right? We speak quickly, which we normally don't do, right? Um, it's super jargony, and a lot of these, like, impact turn, what is that? Mm, right? A lot of us don't know what that stuff is, right? And so, much like any foreign language that requires you to work on it every day or almost every day, debate is a similar thing. And if you can look at your calendar per week or per month and say, I've got 30 seconds or 30 minutes to an hour this day, this day, this day, right? But maybe Thursdays isn't really it. You can negotiate a strategy that's similar to what you do regarding learning a foreign language. And if you can do it a little bit most of the time during the week, all of that time accumulates, right? And I'm generally of the belief that an hour five days a week is better than five hours one day a week. Because do you really think that your learning is better if you cram stuff in a foreign language in five hours when you have a term that starts the next day? I don't think that's a really sustainable or prudent approach. Instead, I think you're better off finding an hour every day, right, to prep before that tournament that maybe starts on Saturday. Right? And thankfully for you at debate camp, have you done some preparation every day for the last week and a half? Yeah, and so as a result, you should feel pretty confident going into this weekend, right, and the tournament that starts tomorrow. Right? But if you have done nothing for a week and a half, right, and we're like, you know what, I'm just gonna read the evidence packet, you know, Wednesday night, right? I'm just gonna like kinda like not show up in my electives. I'm just gonna read the entire evidence packet Wednesday night and expect to do well on Thursday. Do you really think that's gonna happen? Me neither. Right? And hopefully that isn't what you've done. And hopefully we force you to at least do a little bit of debate over time. But I'm a I'm a big fan, I'm of the belief that right, success is largely dictated by what you do Monday through Friday. Right? And it's not only important to know what tournaments you're going to, but know how you can prepare for those tournaments every week. Right? And if you know that Wednesday nights don't work for you because you've got piano practice or you've got right, lacrosse or you've just got like time with family, then it's okay to put aside Wednesday as a day that doesn't work for you. But what should you probably do on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday? Find a little bit of time to do some debate stuff so that you can both increase your likelihood of success right, and also make your life more manageable. I know that when I'm confronted with a situation where I have to do something in five hours that I'm not really used to or that's kind of hard, I'm probably going to start getting anxious. I'm probably going to start freaking out. And that's generally not what most of you want to do. Right? Instead, do a little bit every day. Right? It'll make the end point and the product that you're trying to achieve a lot easier to do. Secondly, and this is pretty basic, but it's really important, know when the tournament takes place. When does the tournament start tomorrow? Huh? 9.30. Who thinks that the tournament starts tomorrow at 9.30? Who thinks it starts later than 9.30? Who thinks it starts before 9.30? All right. Anyone want to tell us what the real answer is? <laughs> you think the tournament starts at 8 a.m.? 9.30, all right, that's good, right? But even you, like there's some uncertainty about where to show up. What happens if you were just under the assumption that the tournament started at 10 and you showed up at 10 for round one? You're gonna lose, right? Because you're 30 minutes late for your round and the judge is gonna be like, eh, sorry, too bad, right? What happens if you show up at 8 a.m. For, for a tournament that starts at 9.30? What are you gonna do for an hour and a half? Right, some of you might start freaking out because you can't find anybody else who's starting to debate. For some of you might prep, for some of you might fall asleep because you got up way too early and you weren't really ready for that, right? Regardless, it's important to know when tournament starts. It's important to know that like the Alpharetta tournament is a one-day tournament that takes place on a Sunday, Lauren? Saturday. Saturday, right? Because what happens if you showed up to Alpharetta High School on a Sunday? There would be no one there. The, the doors would be locked. Ms. Donafel would not be there to let you in, right? You would have missed that tournament. And so knowing when that tournament is is really, really important. Like how many of you drive yourself to high school tournaments to compete? Not many of you, right? And for most of you, you like drive with what? A bus or a van or like the collective unit, right? It's important to know when you're going to be leaving, right? Alpharetta or Houston County or Miami or Nashville, right? To leave for the tournament that you're going to? Because what happens if you miss the bus? You're probably not going to compete. Right? Or you're you know, forced to like take a $600 Uber to wherever you're going. Right? Doesn't seem like an optimal strategy. 
And so little things like knowing when the tournament takes place is mat matters. Like if you don't show up when you're supposed to, do you think you're going to be able to compete? No, right? Are you flying or driving? It's important consideration to know, right? If you're driving an hour away, or that seems doable, what, what happens if it's like a Saturday in the fall in the Atlanta area? Or maybe it's a Sunday in the fall in the Atlanta area. What happens in Atlanta on Saturdays and Sundays in the fall? Football, right? Football happens, right? There's a game at Tech, or there's a bunch of people going to UGA to see the dogs play, right? Or maybe the Falcons, are, they're going to try to get to the Super Bowl and not blow a 28-point lead, right? Who knows, right? But you know that Atlanta on the weekends, traffic can be a problem. What else happens in Atlanta to our interstates? They collapse. They collapse, right? And if you live maybe like in uh, the city, maybe you live in Decatur, Right? And you got to drive up 400 to get to Alpharetta, and they're doing road construction on 400. Do you think you're going to make that trip in an hour on a Saturday or Sunday in the fall? Nope. Right? And do you, it might be a smart idea to know when that tournament starts, 8 a.m., know that there's some maybe construction and maybe you need to leave an hour earlier. Registration starts at 7 30. There you go. It's important to know that. You can't just show up at 8 30 and be like, our bad. But like, Donald's not going to be happy with that. So you need to know when these things take place. Right? To debate tournaments start at noon generally. No, they start in the morning, and so you need to know that for a fact. You can't sleep in like you normally do on Saturdays, right? You have to know when they start. You have to know when you need to give yourself enough time, and you need, you want, you need to make sure you use that time wisely, right? What about the calendar in terms of, like, when tournaments take place? Do you think that the tournament at the end of the year, let's say the TOC or NSDA Nationals, features the same arguments and the same teams and the same right, approaches strategically as the tournaments at the beginning of the year? No, surely, why not? What makes you think that the, the tournaments at the end of the year are different from the tournaments at the beginning of the year? Because at the beginning of the year, they might not be refined. Like All right, so, and why wouldn't they be refined? Because it's just the All right, it's early in the year. Like, you haven't tested out your arguments yet. You haven't really figured out what the negative team is going to have success going for against your ads. You're not really going to figure out what your core negative identity or strategy is going to be. And so it's important to know that early in the year, there's lots of uncertainty going in, right? Do you know for a fact what Cambridge is going to read at the first tournament? You do, because you go to Cambridge, right? But for everybody else, they don't, right? Right? Do you know what USN is going to read at the first term of the year? No, you don't really know, right? There's a lot of uncertainty about what teams can read. And do you have a pretty good sense of what maybe the common apps are going to be based off what we talked about at camp and maybe what you've talked to your friends about? Yeah, but do you also see that like teams might not have an incentive to tell you what their app is going to be early in the year? Yeah, and it's good to know that in the beginning of the year there's a lot more uncertainty. And if there's a lot more uncertainty, does that shape how you prepare and get ready for tournaments? Yeah, it does, right? And does it shape how you prepare for tournaments knowing that at the end of the year you've largely exhausted what's on this topic and in there's really not a whole lot that's going to surprise you. Yeah, right? All those things are super important, right? When tournaments take place, right? What, what time they begin, when they end, where they're located, whether you need to prepare as if you're flying or driving, right? Knowing that tournaments early in the year have a lot more uncertainty associated with them and how that shapes your strategy to prepare, and how tournaments later in the year have a little less uncertainty and how that shapes your strategy to prepare. All of those things are important and go back to the central question of knowing when the tournament takes place. Lastly, Another big picture consideration. Knowing who attends the tournament you're competing at. Okay? So there are certain schools that have a lot of resources and a lot of teams and a lot of coaching. Right? And there are some schools where they don't really have that luxury. Right? And for some of you, do you want to go to tournaments that feature big squads with lots of resources and lots of teams? Well, some of you say no. Why, why, why not go to those tournaments? Right? So it might be harder to win. Okay? Right? Sure, that seems like a positive consideration, right? Maybe you want to win, maybe you don't want to lose, and maybe you think that, hey, if I go to all these tournaments and compete against the best of the best, I won't win. Well, is there also a reason to go to those tournaments to compete against the best of the best? You get better. You get to better, right? Do you think you get better at debate by debating other good debaters? Yeah, absolutely. And maybe that's something to keep in mind, right? Looking at a tournament and being like, hey, Sure, it's only 20 teams, but like it's got MBA, it's got Carrollton, it's got Pace, it's got Westminster, it's got Alpharetta, right? Hey, those are all really good teams, and yeah, do we think we're going to win the tournament? Maybe not, but do we think we're going to learn a lot by competing against those teams? Yeah, right? Well, how many of you like compete at the state tournament? Presumably, and why do you 
you think you compete at the state tournament? Sometimes there's a lot of people show up. At minimum, who does show up? Other people in your state. And do you think that your high school cares about competing against and defeating people in your state? Yeah, absolutely. Now, right, Carrollton Sacred Heart unfortunately cannot come to the Georgia State Tournament, right? For a variety of reasons, namely if they're not in the state of Georgia, right? But Cambridge is going to go to the Georgia State Tournament, right? And do you think your high school would want to know that, hey, you've competed against Alpharetta and Johns Creek and Northview and all the other North Portland County schools and that you've had some success against those teams? Yeah, and why do you think they would care about that? For Rob. Right, because they're your rivals, right? And you know your high schools care about who you debate and who your rivals are and whether you beat them or not. And could those be the best of the best? Maybe not, but they're important, right? And it's important to know who attends your tournaments because some tournaments might not have the prestige and they might not have the best teams, but for certain situations like we get to debate our local rivals and there's some good PR that we can derive from that, that's a pretty good reason to go to a tournament, right? Or you're like, hey, we don't really have much of a local scene. Right? We don't really have a state tournament that we go to. Instead, right, our administration cares about national tournaments and who we compete against on a national level. They want to see us de defeat Green Hill and St. Mark's right, and right, the Chicago schools. And if that matters to you and that matters to your coaches and that matters to your administrations, that's important to keep in mind. Right? And knowing who you debate and who's going to be at your tournaments is an important consideration to keep in mind. And not, none of those are like right or wrong. They ultimately depend on what your goals are, what your school's goals are, et cetera. But all of that stuff matters, right? It's okay to go to a big tournament and know you're going to lose a little bit because you know that you're going to make really good teams and get better. And it's also okay to go to tournaments that maybe don't feature as good of a team because there are some pretty good reasons to go. Maybe you'll win a little bit more. Maybe you want that confidence. Maybe you'll beat your high school rivals. And maybe that's a good thing, right? Or maybe. You know, hey, it's only an hour away, and I can be home by like a Sunday afternoon and like focus on my schoolwork. That seems an important consideration too, right? And all those things matter, right? Know the calendar, know when a tournament takes place, know who's attending those tournaments are really big picture questions that I don't think we give enough credit to and we don't think enough about. But I really do think those are important considerations when thinking about how to effectively prepare, prepare for tournaments. Little smaller picture steps that I think are super important. One, and I think this is one of the most important things that seems obvious that people really don't invest enough time thinking about. You should set goals. How do you know how to prepare for something if you haven't set a goal or an aspiration regarding the thing you're preparing for? Right? If you want to win the TOC, don't you think you should think about what you need to do to prepare to win the TOC? I don't call me crazy. I think you probably should. Right? If you want to win the GFCA state tournament, don't you think you need to think about how to know what that entails in order to effectively prepare? Obviously, right? Knowing that the TOC features 78 teams from around the country is an important consideration because do you think that that requires a certain level of preparation that maybe preparing for a local high school tournament that only features five schools requires? Absolutely, right? And do you think that competing for the GFCA, which features maybe 20 schools from around the state, requires a certain level of preparation that, right, you know, a scrimmage that only is between you and your rival high school involves? Yeah, right, you gotta set those goals. And after you set those goals, that largely helps you shape and largely dictates how you prepare, right? And this isn't just a key to success in debate, it's usually key to success outside, right, of it, right? If you wanna get to Harvard, don't you think you need to sort of have an idea of how to prepare to get into Harvard? Yeah, you can't just be like, I'm gonna wing it, whatever. They'll figure it out, I'm awesome, they'll see it. Mm, it doesn't really work that way, right? If you wanna, like, become a professional athlete, don't you think that that, that idea requires you to sort of have a, a sense of what the process entails? Do you think LeBron is just like hanging around all day for a week, not shooting any basketball, just showing up? I don't think so, he's pretty talented, but like even LeBron doesn't just like show up, right? No, nah, he's thought about that goal for a while. That's been his goal, one to be the greatest or one of the greatest. And as a result, he understands the process that that, that, that entails, right? I got to commit time every day. I got this has to be my priority. Maybe I should go to Miami or leave Miami to maximize my chances of success, right? Having a goal is vitally important for your process to be successful because if you don't have a goal, what is that process for? Like I'm a big fan of the process, but process for process sake doesn't matter. Right? The process has to be tied to something important. Else, why would you commit yourself to the process? Right? You gotta have that goal. Having that goal allows you to commit yourself to that process and allows you to sort of figure out what that process entails in order to increase your likelihood of success. 
What are those goals? How many of you go to tournaments to win the tournament? Wow, not many of you. Okay. Well, then why do you go to tournaments? To learn. To learn. Oh, that's awesome. I hope that continues, right? I like to learn, but I like to win a little bit more, right? And so that's the goal I have, right? And is it cool that my debaters might learn if they go 1-7 at a tournament? Sure, it's better than going 1-7 and not learning, right? But at its core, I have a competitive goal, right? I want my teams to win, right? And I want to win because I kind of see my you know, identity tied into what their competitive success is, right? Likewise, I have debaters that want to win too, right? And do you think that winning the tournament requires a certain knowledge of a process and a certain ability to prepare that's far different from just showing up and learning? Yeah, it certainly does, right? How many of you have a goal of maybe being the top speaker in your lab this weekend? All right, okay, some of you do. Well, do you think that's important to know, you know beforehand if you're actually gonna become the top speaker? Do you think you're just gonna show up and be the top speaker in your lab? Probably not. Right? Sharice, if she wants to be the top speaker in my lab, probably needs to do what every day of camp? She's got to speak. Right? You just got to do that. Right? You can't just show up and be like, all right, I'm going to be top speaker what? No, that's not how it works. Usually the top speakers at tournaments are the ones that spend time doing what? Speaking. Right? Whether it's speaking drills or practice speeches or maybe watching themselves in prior debates and picking up on little ticks. Right? That might have been distracting. So, Viba, what did we do early in camp? What was our tendency? Um, to say all. All right, that's one, but this is more regarding your movement. Oh, walking around. Right? You walked around a lot. Like, Viba was just like walking in circles, arguing, right? With his laptop. <laughs> right? And he was saying good stuff, but like, I was kind of like, what's going on? Why are you walking in circles? It's kind of distracting, right? And, you know, Bibbop's got competitive goals. He wants to do well in debate. And so, you know, I felt compelled to say, hey, you're making good, you're making good arguments, but you're kind of distracting while you're walking around, right? And so after that, he did what? He didn't walk in circles. Instead, he walked right in front of me, just like right up in my face, right? And I was like, okay, that's progress, right? It's not a circle anymore, right? right? But through that process, right, he got some feedback, right, and he continued to work on his speaking. And as a result, he doesn't do that anymore. Right? He has less distraction so that I can then focus on the substantive argument that he's making. And as a result, he's going to do better as a speaker. Sometimes we say um or uh. Sometimes we play with our hair. Sometimes we have nervous tics, like tapping a table. Right? Well, all those things aren't going to get better if you just show up and never address them. Instead, if you have the goal of being a good speaker and a top speaker, and you work on how to improve your speaking ability on a day-to-day -day or mostly day-to-day -day basis, you'll see results, and you'll be more likely to achieve those goals. What's in, what distinguishes our form of debate, policy debate, from Lincoln Douglas? All right, but like more basic than that. All right, you don't know. Yeah, what? All right, but content-wise, that makes sense. Let's just think like in terms of people. What distinguishes what we do from Lincoln Douglas? Yeah. We have a partner. We have a partner, right? Your success at its core is dictated by what? Your partnership, right? And do you think it might behoove you to share your goals with your partner at some point? Yeah, right? If your goal is to like be top speaker and your partner's goals is like to just show up, I don't really think it's gonna work. Right? If your goal is to win the tournament and your partner's like, I really don't care, I'm just kind of there to see my boob. Right? I don't really think that's gonna work, right? It's important to share those goals. You're on a team. Right? You cannot change that. Most tournaments don't even allow you to debate on your own in policy. Right? There are rules that, it, that prohibit you, you know, from debating as a matter. And so you have to know that you have a partner. And you're more likely to achieve your goals if you converse with your partner, if you share your goals, and try to get on the same page. Right? Is that a guarantee? No, but I'm pretty confident that you're not going to achieve your goals if you and your partner haven't had a conversation about what those goals intend. What about short versus long-term goals? Barad, is yeah. getting better a short-term goal or is that more of a long-term long goal? Term. It's a long-term goal, right? It's really hard to quantify how much better you've gotten in a debate after a speech, right? Can you do it? Sure. Like, hey, I didn't do LML on the prior speech. I did this one. Hey, I'm way better, right? But generally, learning, getting better, right? Oh, I can spell the letter. I can spell the. I can spell the letter K. Okay, cool, right? It's probably going to take some time, right? Did Did all of you just like magically learn the K after Jason's lecture yesterday? 
Some of you might have, but most of you are like, oh, this K thing is kind of weird, it's kind of complex, we're not really used to it, and that's a long-term goal, to be better at the K. It's not going to resolve itself over one round. Likewise, right, are there certain short-term goals that you can achieve in one round? Yeah, like, if you have the goal of defeating NBA, there's one way to achieve that goal. You beat NBA, right? That's a short-term goal. My short-term goal is to beat NBA this weekend. Well, if you beat them round one, guess what? You've met your goal. Right? But things like winning a tournament, not really something you can achieve in a round or a speech. Right? Getting better is something that usually takes time. It's the accumulation of multiple rounds over time, not something that just happens after round two at the end of tournament. But it's important to have both short-term and long-term goals. What happens if you only have a long-term goal? Right? Don't you need some short-term reinforcement in order to keep that dream alive, to remain committed to that outcome? Absolutely. So you might have the long-term goal of winning the TOC, but if you're a ninth grader, what are the odds that you're going to win the tournament champions? Pretty low, right? I guess it presumably could happen, right? But the odds are really low. Instead, you're going to have to realize that, hey, that's a long-term goal that will require years and years of time and commitment. And are you going to lose debates between now and when you win the TOC? Absolutely, because guess what debate forces you to do? Lose! No one has ever been undefeated at debate. No one. How many of you like to lose? Not many. I like to lose. Do you know why I like to lose? Because it forces me to get better. Right? It confronts the fact that I have not done what I am supposed to do. And I need to change things so that I can improve. Right? But that took me time to sort of come around to that. At first I hated it. Like I'm already grumpy, according to some. Right? And do you think grumpy people losing things is like a recipe for like kittens and rainbows? Obviously not. Right? And so when I would lose, I get furious. Right? And it took me time to realize, look, right, there's a reason why I don't like to lose, and it's not because of like the short term I like to lose, but rather, right, it's a setback. And it took me a while to get used to the fact that losing can be productive. Right? That yeah, a short term loss can be consistent with a long term gain. Right? That losing the NBA round one at the first term of the year does not deny my ability to beat them in a couple of years when I can be better at debate. But having those short-term goals is important because it's really hard to sustain a long-term commitment if there aren't short-term successes along the way. Right? So sometimes you've got to go to a regional tournament with only maybe 10 teams to have some success in order for you to have confidence and enthusiasm to go to the bigger tournament where there are more teams. Right? Sometimes you've got to give that practice speech again Right? Even though you don't want to, so you can actually give the speech that you want to give. To give the speech that sounds correct, so that in the long term you can feel more confident about your ability to become the best critique debater in the country. Short term and long term goals are super important. When you have long term goals, it's important to view them through the spectrum of short term success or failure. And you need short term goals and short term you know, considerations in order to give you the motivation to continue to strive for those long term goals. <laughs> right? I'm generally a fan of having tangible goals. Like getting better is not really tangible. Right? That's hard. Right? Instead, I'd say I'm gonna flow 90% of what the two EC set. Right? Or I'm gonna do line by line for all eight minutes of my two and C. Right? Or I'm gonna cut ten cards to death. Right? All of those things can't be considered getting better, correct? But they're far more tangible and achievable. Right? I'm going to work harder this week at debate. What does that mean? I don't know. Instead, make it tangible. Right? I'm going to work an hour a day for five days. Right? Or I'm going to give a practice speech every day for five days. Or I'm going to talk to my coach three times a week when I normally only do it once. Are all of those things tangible signals of working harder? Yeah. And so one thing that a lot of us struggle with is that we set these goals that are getting better, improvement, like having fun, et cetera, but we haven't really defined them or come up with tangible ways to sort of evaluate them, to have metrics about whether or not we've done them or not. And so I love the goal of doing better and getting better, but if you don't have tangible examples of what that means, they're really hard to achieve. So if your goal is, I want to do better at the next tournament I go to, why not say, I want to win more debates at the next tournament that I go to? Right? I want to speak better, okay. Right? But what does that mean? Right? Maybe you want to say, I want to improve my speaker position by like five. Like maybe you're like tenth speaker as the tournament you went to, and maybe you want to improve it. Right? Rather than being like improve, who knows? Like you can have higher speaker points in the next tournament that actually be placed lower ranking. Because if the tournament's bigger, that's just how the math works. Right? But if your goal is I want to have a higher total of speaker points, 
at my next tournament. That's a far more tangible thing than I want to speak better, which could mean you have to be ranked higher, or it could mean you have to have higher speaker points. But having a tangible sense of your goals is super and super important. Lastly, and I've already talked a little bit about this, realize that failure in debate is inevitable. You cannot win all the time. Are you going to achieve every goal you have in debate? Or are you going to achieve every goal you have in life? Hate to break it to you, you're not. Right? I want to win the NDT. Like, that's my goal as a coach in college. That's our national championship tournament. Have I won the NDT? I have not. Sad face. Right? Well, am I going to give up? Not yet. No, I'm going to continue to strive towards that. Right? And that's the goal that I want to work towards. And am I going to have failure along the way? Yeah, every year that I don't win the NDT is a failure to an extent. But hopefully, and thankfully, I have seen that every year that passes that I don't win the NDT, I can take things that we've learned, areas where we've gotten better, so that I have a better sense of what that entails. But you have to know you're going to lose. Most of you are going to lose a debate this weekend. It's just reality. No one wins all the debates. Are you prepared for that inevitability? Some of you are. Some of you might not. But you should be. Because if you lost, that means something wrong went down. Something went awry. And you can either listen to that, take some feedback from your coaches as an opportunity to get better and maybe increase your chances for success in the future, or you can give up. Hopefully you don't give up, right? Because there's a way to get better every round you have in the tournament. But you will lose. You will fail to meet your goals. You will not get what you want in life. That's the harsh reality of being a human being. But that shouldn't deter you from setting goals from committing yourself to the process, and having faith that, hey, if I commit myself to something like debate, and doing the little things to improve, that you will see the positive results, you will see an achievement of most of the goals you have, and that you'll get out of debate what you want to get out of. Next, small picture goal. I'm a fan of setting what's known as hit lists, right? Our targets for who you are going to debate, right? When I debated, I was motivated by not necessarily arguments that I debated, but teams and individuals that I wanted to debate, right? So like Tim Baruch coached at a school in the North Shore of Chicago, right, that a lot of people know about called Northwestern. And when I was in college, the team I wanted to defeat the most was Northwestern. Do you know why that was the case? One, they won. Right? They're arguably the greatest team in college debate history. They won. Like, they are the best. Right? And so, do we generally evaluate ourselves based off what the best do? Yeah, for competitive folk, we do. Secondly, it was more personal. Do you know where I wanted to go to school when I was in high school? Northwestern. Northwestern. Right? And I couldn't go because, like, you know, I'm a middle class kid from Alabama. Like, we couldn't really make the finances work, and I really didn't want to go into debt. And so, there's also that sort of personal, right, stake. Like, I didn't get to go there, right? And as a result, what am I going to do? I'm trying to take it out of Northwestern, right? Those Evanston folks, right? And for me, that, like, kind of motivated me. And so every time I was a student and I saw that Northwestern was at a tournament, I automatically put them on my hit list, right? That's the team that motivated me to do my best, to work hard, to stay up late, to get another practice speech, et cetera. And so I always make sure they're on my hit list, right? Maybe you're at Cambridge, right? Maybe you want to have those North Fulton County high schools on your hit list because you know that it's important to beat those teams. Right? Or maybe you're from a small school, right? Or maybe you're from an upstart like Cypress Bet, right? And you want to beat the Carrollton Sacred Hearts in Florida because they're the standard bearers for the last, I don't know, 20 years. And maybe you think that, hey, I'm going to put that team on my hit list because that's going to motivate me to do the work I need to do to get better. Because if we can beat, if we can beat Carrollton Sacred Heart, we've proved that, like, hey, Cypress Bay can hang. Right? Or maybe you're USN and you know that that team down the road at NBA has a long history of success, right? And maybe you've got to commit yourself to doing a little bit more to beating them and maybe you want to put them on your hit list. And there are two approaches that I think that go into this like hit list, this target, right, that I think helps motivate you and helps guide your research and preparation for tournaments. One is, right, who do you want to beat, right? Most of us, when we debate, we want to beat teams that are good, right? I don't know, it seems intuitive, right? And so you usually want to include teams on your hit list that you aspire to defeat, right? <laughs> And maybe you do, right? It, maybe you want to put teams on your hit list that you debate a lot at tournaments. <laughs> Don't you think it makes sense to prepare for teams that you debate all the time? I think it's important to kind of know that because if you know you're going to debate right, a team twice every tournament, it seems like that might be something you want to prepare for given the likelihood that you will encounter them again, right? 
Should you put teams that maybe you're better than, but maybe only slightly? Yeah, because what did we just say? Who should you put on your list? Teams that are a little bit better than you. So if you're putting teams that are a little bit better than you, that you aspire to be, don't you think that those teams will put you on their hit list, knowing that you're a little bit better than them? Yeah, and what happens if you just show up, not preparing for a team that's a little bit worse than you, that has put in the time to beat you in a debate? You'll probably lose. And so you have to prepare for a variety of teams. Right? Teams are a little bit better than you because you want to beat them. That sort of gives you the motivation that the process is working. You want to put the teams that you debate all the time, right? Because you know you're going to debate them, you want to have some success. And you should also put the teams that you're a little bit better than, right? Knowing that, hey, if we take this team for granted, we're not going to beat them. And that's maybe not where you want to be. Do you think it's important to have a hit list that is manageable given the time that you have every day? Right? Do you really think you're going to prepare for 100 teams in a week? No, not possible. Like you don't really have that much time, right? Instead, maybe your hit list for a 100-team tournament should be the 20 teams that you think you're likely going to debate, right? But if the GFCA state tournament is 25 teams, do you think you can prepare for 25 teams in a couple weeks? Yeah. And so you have to be willing to adjust that hit list, that set of teams that you prepare for. And you have to pay attention to how many teams are at that tournament and realize, hey, I can actually prepare for 25 teams because I've got two weeks to do that. But hey, this tournament's got 150 teams. Am I really going to prepare for all 150 in two weeks? No. And instead, come up with things like, well, I want to beat this team. These are the teams that we always beat. These are the teams that I feel confident that we're, you know, we need to beat to have the kind of result we want to have. And maybe that list is only 20 to 30 teams, right? I generally think that we're only capable of preparing for about 10 teams a week, right? So if you've got two weeks to prepare for a tournament, you've probably got like 20 teams you can kind of prepare for. Sometimes less, sometimes more. Sometimes life gets in the way. Yeah. So is it better to prepare to like adapt to like judges that you know are going to be at the tournament, or is it better to adapt to like the teams that you know that they can, the strategies to beat those? I mean, in a perfect world, you're prepared for both, and you prepare for both. But you know, you don't always know who's going to judge you. Right? Just because a judge at a tournament doesn't mean that you'll get that judge there. But if you have a team at a tournament, the odds are good that you'll debate that team. And so I generally think it's better to prepare for the team, more so the judge, because you have more control over that process, right? And for most judges, if you've done adequate and good preparation for that team from an argument perspective, you'll usually do okay regardless of who the judge is. Are there some exceptions? Sure, right? There might be a judge who doesn't flow, or a judge that can't spell K, right? Or a judge that loves policy debate and hates everything else. Like, who knows, right? For, for the most part, I generally think if you prepare for teams, you're more likely to succeed than if you prepare for judges, because we have more control, or at least there's a greater likelihood that you'll debate those teams, then you'll get the perfect judge in the perfect spot, or the wrong judge in the wrong spot. And follow up, is it better, or can you, when you're prepping for like a specific team, like should you maybe like take into consideration, you know, the, what the school degree runs, or like what the coach likes? Obviously, it's never a bad idea to know what Carrollton Sacred Heart runs in debate. Now, I know what Carrollton Sacred says in debate. They run the K all the time, right? Uh, no. Okay, but there are some teams that do, right? There are some teams that have a mixture of critique and policy arguments, right? There are some teams that only go for the politics to settle the negative and only read a really big F, right, when they debate on the affirmative. There are some teams that read really tiny Fs all the time, right, but maybe read the kind of cheating process counterplans. All of that intelligence matters, and all of that intel gathering matters in the, in the process of preparation, right? And in a perfect world, you have all that information Monday through Friday before you step foot at a tournament. But sometimes you don't know, right? Sometimes you've never debated a team before, and so you don't really know. But what do you do if you debate a team that you've never debated before? Are you just like totally blind? No, what can you do to maybe get some intelligence about that team? Well, I mean, like if they're off, they have to disclose. And uh, what rule says they have to disclose? Or, well, the wiki, right? Okay, but some teams don't contribute to the wiki, too. That's it. Right, but how can you get intel on a team you've never debated? Go look at their past. Exactly, right? You know, you can maybe go to tabroom.com and see who they debated and maybe find someone that you know and reach out to them and find. Or maybe it's round three to tournament and you track down the team they debated round one or round two to get that intelligence to give yourself a little bit of, of an edge, right? To figure out what they do. Because not everybody contributes to the wiki, right? Not everybody is super open and great about disclosure, right? There's never a bad, it's never a bad thing to kind of take the extra step to sort of confirm what these teams are saying or to at least give you some sense of what they said given that you never debated them. 
but that extra information is part of the preparation process and it usually only helps you, it never really hurts you. Is it a pain in the butt? Sometimes. But if the goal is to win or to get more information about your opponents, sometimes you gotta like talk to some strangers and to get a sense of kind of what those teams have said. All right, uh, done, 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 done. Next, I think you should create assignment lists for every tournament you go to, right? Now in a perfect world, you have a coach that does this for you. But how many of you debate on squads where you don't really have a coach that does this? Most, a lot of you, okay? So if your coach isn't gonna do this, or if you don't have a coach that does this, that means that who has to do it? You do, or your teammates as a collective unit do, and it's not that hard. Right? If you've done your hit list, if you paid attention to who's debating at this tournament, then you know that, hey, there are 10 affirmatives we have to prepare for. Do you think you can divide up those 10 affirmatives between you and your teammates? Yeah, it seems doable, right? And if you, uh, you know, know that there are 20 teams that go to the tournament, but pretty much everybody in the negative on this year's top is going to read the neoliberalism critique or the Trump bad DA, right? you can kind of spread out those assignments to make sure that they're all taken care of. Now, do you think that you would disseminate those assignments the Thursday before the tournament? It starts on a Friday. Why not? Because again, you know, you're you don't want to burn yourself out right before a tournament. Right. If you've taken classes like Monday through Friday or Monday through Thursday, let's say you've had three tests, right? And it's 9 p.m. on a Thursday. Your tournament starts at 2 p.m. on a Friday, and now you have three assignments to do. Does that really seem like a sustainable strategy or one that's conducive to your happiness? And no, that's not what you want to do, right? And so. Not only should you make assignment lists before every tournament, you should strive to do that as early as possible, right? Because of things like tavern, because of things like joy of tournaments, because of things like, I don't know, having friends and talking to others, maybe talking to your coaches, you can generally have a good idea of who's gonna be at what tournaments, right? And do you think having an assignment sent, list sent out two weeks is better than two days before it's due? Obviously. Now, is it perfect? No, sometimes you maybe only have an assignment list that gets put out maybe four days before. But four days is still better than two days in terms of giving you more time to prepare. And generally, do you like it when your classes have like a schedule of when assignments are due? Yeah, because like, do you think a class is easy if you're just like winging it and you never really know when things are due and a teacher's like, all right, who's got their test? And nobody's really ready for the <laughs> test. No, you're not. That's not a good way to teach. Assignment list and the same thing. Have your assignments, create them, strive to do them early, and involve all the people that you need to involve. Do you think you should involve your coaches in, in the assignment list that you come up with? Yeah, like their experience, they should know, right? Because Donatel probably has more experience in determining whether or not something is worthy of being on an assignment list than not. Or you can be like, hey, why do you put the like, we should educate kids about at NASA F. We have a neg to that, I just did it, like two days ago. You don't need to do that, recover. Instead, you should be able to be like, oh, this list is pretty good, but you're like kind of missing the Cambridge neg. Maybe we want to work on that. Right? And so including your coaches makes sense. Do you want to include your teammates? Yes! Right? Because you, can you do all of this work on your own? No. you got to spread the wealth, take advantage of economies of scale, and realize that if you each do a little bit, it will all accumulate, and you'll all be able to benefit. You probably want to include your partner. Right? Maybe you don't remember what you lost to three straight negative debates at the prior tournament. Maybe your partner needs to be like, uh, duh, the Neil K. Right? And maybe you need to be reminded that, hey, Maybe that should be on the assignment list because we keep on losing to the neoliv K. Okay? It's important to know. And maybe consult your partner makes a lot of sense. Sometimes it makes sense to talk to your friends. So like Hernan and I are friends, we've been friends for a long time. And sometimes we share ideas and intel about like what teams say or like what the cool politics to set is, or like we bemoan like, oh my god, like the Trump DA is trash. What do we do? Right? We have those conversations. And sure we could be competitive about it, but like why? Right? We know it's going to be debated, and we might as well just like make sure that we all have an idea of what's been said, right? so that we can all prepare accordingly, and just have faith that if Emory's prepared and UGA's prepared, that we're going to have a pretty fair debate, and we'll see how the chips fall. And hopefully we win, hopefully they don't, but eh, who knows? We'll see. But we, I even talk to my competitors about who says what. Right? I don't tell them exactly what we're going to do, but I ask them, like, hey, what are some of the positives that says you've heard? Or, hey, have you done any updates yet? What does this look like? to give myself uh, some direction about where to go. And you should be fine talking to your friends and or competitors that you can at least talk to and get a sense of what needs to be on your assignment list. Right? If you know that the Iran deal is gonna be a salient issue this week because you paid attention to CNN and your friends have been talking about it, it seems like important to know and maybe something to put on your assignment list. But if you're the only person that thinks something is important and no one else shares that, that view from you, that might be a sign that like, it's not really worthy of being on your assignment list unless you really, really know it's gonna be important. 
Next, you should talk to people if you debate. You should talk to people in debate. Now, what is something that's common amongst some of us that do debate? Are we super social and outgoing and bubbly? No, we do this because we're kind of nerdy, right? Like, we tried, like, baseball, but, like, eh, when we strike out 30 straight times, maybe we got the idea that it wasn't for us, right? Or maybe we're like, you know, we gave up our basketball dream in the NBA because we realized we're 5'9", and that's just, like, not really going to get it done unless we're Isaiah Thomas, okay? Right? We do this because we're kind of nerdy, we're kind of geeky, and not all of us are really social, right? Or if we are, we're social in, like, really small groups, right? But what happens when you're in debate, right? How many people do policy debate in high school? A lot! Right? And what happens if you only talk to like four people? You're probably not helping. You're probably not figuring out who's doing what term. You're probably not helping yourself in terms of like what other teams say. And so you have to talk to people. Right? Maybe you want to be known as like that really nice like debater from that small school in Georgia. Okay. All right. Or maybe you're the next best thing in NBA, the next best thing at Carrollton Sacred Heart. Or hey, you're the next kid from like. Cairo, Georgia, that's like gonna shock the world and like win a bunch of tournaments. Like it happens, right? And maybe you want to have a positive reputation in debate. Because believe it or not, do you know what judges sometimes use to decide who wins and loses debates? Who's polite? The likability. It matters. Right? I have to tell my debaters to like chill out and stop being a butthole sometimes. Because I'm like, look, in a world of a close debate, we are still human beings. And sometimes things like likability and politeness matter. Right? Sometimes little intangible things like confidence and amicability matter. Right? And you have to be one to, who's willing to talk to your judges in a civil way, or who's willing to be liked by your opponents in order to take advantage of that sort of intangible perk that sometimes does determine who wins and loses debates. Should you talk to your coaches? Yes. Believe it or not, most of your coaches want you to talk to them about debate because they're debate coaches. I think that's what they do. And sometimes, right, even a little thing like, hey, can I talk to you about this file is exactly what they need after a long day of teaching AP Gov, right? Or just like a bunch of crazy kids in like whatever math class they did, right? You should not feel bad about talking to your coaches about debate. They have made their living. They have made the choice to do this for their job. I love debate. I want to talk about debate. And I want you to talk to me about debate. Right? And a lot of the times, as young students, we feel like we're burdening them. Right? They're like, hey, like, eh, I like, really don't think they want to talk to me about this, but they do. Right? D. Height wants to talk about debate because D. Height is a huge debate nerd and that's what he does for a living. Right? And Ms. Donnefeld wants to talk about debate because she loves debate and she wants to help you get better at it. And do you think that you're going to be better off if you talk to your coaches about what you're working on? Yeah. Do you think you'd be better off if you talk to your coach about what you need to improve? Yeah. Yeah. Right? Do you think you'd be better off to talk to your coach to make sure that, hey, I'm working on this thing, but maybe they're going to tell me to work on something else? Yeah. All of those things benefit you, and you should be able to talk to them. You should obviously talk to your partner. Right? What's the pragmatic reason to talk to your partner? <laughs> you debate with them. Right? Do you really think you're going to have success if like, you're just doing your thing and they're doing their thing? No, that's not how it works, right? You got to make sure you're on the same page, right? Barad, you got to make sure you talk to Sharice before you're one yard to make sure that you've you've got a plan to cover everything, right? Right? Do you does the two in and the one in need to talk to each other after the two AC to make sure you've divided the block effectively to make sure you're not overlapping what you're exactly? You have to talk to your partner. And do you think you should talk to your partner when you're not at tournaments as well? Yeah, I'll let you guess how many successful partnerships exist where they only talk to each other at tournaments and then they think that they're dead to each other for the remainder of the time. That's not a thing, right? That, that is not the norm. You have to be able to talk to your partner. Does that mean you have to be besties with your partner? Yeah. No, right? It doesn't, but it means that you should talk to them some to make sure they know when they need to show up to a tournament, to make sure that they know that there's an assignment list, that they know that there's a practice to be scheduled on a Thursday night that both of you would benefit from doing. You gotta talk to your partner. Lastly, you should talk to other people in debate, just beyond your team, right? Talk to your friends on other squads, talk to your competitors, talk to your judges. That stuff matters. Like, it benefits you that other co coaches know your name in a positive way, right? That benefits you. And if you don't know who the coaches are at tournaments, you should introduce yourself to them. It will only help you, right? If Brett Flater doesn't know your name, 
but you see him at tournaments in the state of Georgia, you should introduce yourself to Brett Flader because the odds are good that Brett Flader is going to coach you, to coach against you, to interact with you in some way, shape, or fashion, and introducing yourself to Brett Flader and making a positive impression can only help you if you have competitive goals or even the simple goal of getting better today. Lastly, and then I'll end it. One, the small things matter. We have all these big picture ideas about winning tournaments and like going 6-0 and being top speaker or like being the best K debater in the state of Georgia, whatever it may be, but the small things really matter. How many of you have flow paper right now? A lot of you don't, but what do you know you're gonna have to do later this afternoon? Flow, because you're gonna be debating. How many of you have pens? Right? Well, why do you need to have pens? Flow. To flow. Okay? How many of you have timers? How many of you use them? Way too many. That is definitely not true. Okay? But why do you have timers? To keep track of the speech. And what happens when we don't keep track of our time for a while? Because you do what? You drop two disheads. Okay? I did. Right? But what's not going to happen today? Because you're going to do what? You're going to time yourself. Right? Little things like that matter. If you don't have a timer at a tournament, the odds are good that something like that could happen. Right? What happens if you don't time your partner's speech? You can't tell them to move on. You don't really know what's going on. Those are the little things that actually matter. Right? Do you have Word, the latest version of Word, installed on your laptop? Do you have your charger? All right, let's say you like travel to Dallas to a debate tournament. You don't have a charger. RIP, right? That's tough, right? You're either that guy that asks all the randos for like if you can get a charger on a laptop, which is kind of annoying, or you're you're like antisocial and you refuse to talk to people for two years in debate, and so you're just kind of stuck with like a battery that has like five percent battery life, and you're closing it every time and opening it every time, and then it like dies around four in your toast, right? No, the little things matter, right? How many of you like get hungry at debate tournaments? Okay, so what do you do? Like, see, it's like in the middle of the like 1 AR. Can you just like leave the room and like go to the cafeteria and get like a slice of pizza? You could. Does that sound like a good idea though? No. Right? So maybe you want to bring some snacks. Right? Maybe have some trail mix or maybe some dried fruit. Maybe jerky is your thing. Who knows? Right? Seems like a good idea. How many of you are over reliant on coffee in the mornings to wake up? Right? Probably more of you. Right? But what do you think is important? That you get some coffee before you start debating round one, or you're just like, eh, I'll be all right. You might want to get some coffee, right? Right? For some of you, maybe it's like, I need to make sure I fill my water bottle, because if I don't, like, my mouth gets dry and my, like, throat hurts. Or maybe you're with someone who, like, always gets sick at tournaments. If you always get sick at tournaments, what do you think you might want to have on hand? Medicine. Right? There are some people in debate that are super klutzy, that like fall and get paper cuts and hurt themselves all the time. What might you want at tournaments? Band-aids. Right? Those little things matter because do you really think you're going to have a chance of success if you're just bleeding all over the laptop and the desk that you're debating on? Probably not, if I had to guess. Right? Do you really think you're going to have success if you run out of flow paper consistently at tournaments? No. Right? There are little things too, like how many judges don't have flow paper or pens? A lot. So what might that convince you to do when you go to tournaments? Bring it up for just yourself and your partner? Bring extra. Because you know what one of those little things are that maybe a judge will appreciate at the end of the round when they're struggling to vote for who? Maybe the fact that you're the nice person that gave them a flow paper and a pen. Maybe that's the like intangible thing that gets them to vote for you. You never really know. right? But those little things matter. Do you think sleeping in tournaments matters? Yes. How many of you struggled to go to sleep the first few days of camp? A lot of you did. Right? That's important to know. You gotta sleep and eat. Right? If you're going to a one day tournament, maybe it's not that big of a thing. But if you're gonna go to a tournament that's a three day tournament where there's a long travel day on the front end and a long travel day on the back end, it's important to know that this thing is a long slog. It's a race. It's a journey. You can't just like be ready to go on day one and then just kind of peter out on day two if you have goals of winning the tournament. You have to be prepared the whole time. You gotta get some sleep, you gotta eat, you gotta drink, etc. Lastly, and this is really important. You shouldn't let the situation overwhelm you, right? For some of you, you set lofty goals. For some of you, you want to do big things. For some of you, maybe you've set the goal of winning the camp tournament. Well, what should you remind yourself of ultimately? There's a chance that you might not be the top speaker in your lab. And is life going to go on? Yeah, 
right? Is it going to be okay if you're the third speaker in your lab and not the first? Sure, right? That's okay. It's the Indy Camp Tournament at the end of the day. Hernan, do you remember who like had the best record at the Indy Camp Tournament last year? I do. Okay, <laughs> but most of us don't. Like, I don't know who did had the best record at the Indy Tournament last year. I don't know. Do you know why I don't know? Because it doesn't matter. Right? I care that you had a good time at the Indy. I care that you learned a lot at camp. I care that, like, hey, you won a debate because that was your goal, or like, you got a speaker award because that was your goal, or hey, like, you didn't win any debates, but I learned how to like do line by line, and I downloaded verbatim, so like, life is good. <laughs> like to me, those were like pretty good goals for a lot of you at debate camp, and it's important to realize that this is just a camp tournament, right? That it's okay to lose a debate every now and then because you're here to learn, you're here to get better, not to win the Indy camp tournament and to not let the situation overwhelm you. If you need to go like take a walk to get some air, go take a walk to get some air, right? If you need to go like have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with your coach to help you kind of like dampen your anxiety, go do that, right? If you need a like friendly fist pound from like your lab leader to help motivate you to, to do better, just put it out there. I'm willing to just like give you a little dab. No, that's fine with that, right? Don't let the situ situation overwhelm you. Realize that you're going to debate a lot. You're going to lose a lot. You're going to win a lot. You're going to learn. You're going to not learn. There are going to be some up. There's going to be ups. There are going to be downs, right? But the little things of just having the awareness that it's going to be okay should do a lot to kind of calm your nerves, calm your anxieties, and allow you to focus on what you're here for, which is to hopefully learn, to hopefully win, and to hopefully have a fun time, whether it's in debate or at the camp tournament in the next couple of days. Yeah? So as far as, like, anxiety goes, if you have, like, really bad anxiety, like, what's the... What are the best like, you have really bad anxiety, really? What are like, the best preventative measures you can take to like, you know, have? What's the best support system that you can build? Well, I don't know. So, do you do you have experience in other areas where like maybe anxiety has been a problem where you've been able to manage it? I'm guessing there are some examples. Okay. Okay. Yeah, sure. Well, think back to that. Like, what are analogous situations where I've been able to sort of manage my anxiety and then try to find analog style, like how you can do that in the day? Right? Sometimes, like, some people are, like, really intense and they, like, set a timer, like, as soon as the round is over with and they, like, time how long it takes the judge to decide. Like, that would freak me out. I can't do that. Right? I can't do that. But some people do that because, it, like, it makes it kind of a game. It makes it interesting and that's a way to distract themselves from the reality that there's going to be a winner and a loser. Some people, like, in debate, like, some people just go for walks. They, like, go get some fresh air. They kind of walk around to clear their head. Some people like go out, they look at their phone, they maybe call someone that they care about, their parent, their boo, their friend, right? Um, you know, some people like check Facebook, some people check like ESPNs. There are lots of things that you can do to kind of cope with anxiety, but you know, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not really equipped to, to help, you know, provide a, a, a shot, really, you know, silver bullet solution to anxiety, but the best advice I can give you is to try to find analogous situations where you've been able to cope or manage your anxieties and try to export them into the debate situation. I generally found if it worked in one area, it's more likely to work in the debate situation as well. Other questions, thoughts, comments? No? All right, well, good luck. Have a good day today. And during lunch, there's an opportunity for any students who were part of the Atlanta Urban Debate League or who will be debating in the Atlanta Urban Debate League next year. So, real quickly, if you are interested in finding out what the opportunity is and taking advantage of it, I believe it should be Rockdale, Campbell, Drew Charter, New Manchester, Cross Creeds, Grady. My list may be incomplete. Come and see me at the front if you are interested. Otherwise, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.